Lakeland PBS, the Bemidji Pioneer, the Brainerd Dispatch, and Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2020, a look at our area legislative candidates. And now the House District 5A debate. Your moderator tonight is Bethany Wesley. Hello again, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Debate Night 2020. I'm Bethany Wesley. This next debate featuring the candidates seeking to represent State House District 5A concludes our second night of debates here on Lakeland PBS. This year, we're pleased to feature nine state legislative debates to be held over four nights of television. I'm coming to you tonight from our PBS studio here in Bemidji, but our candidates and our panelists are joining us remotely due to COVID-19. We're still glad everyone's able to join us. The candidates seeking to represent House District 5A are Representative John Purcell from the Democratic Farmer Labor Party and Matt Bliss from the Republican Party. Our panelists are Heidi Holton, Public Affairs Director for Northern Community Radio, KAXE and KBXE, Dennis Wyman, Lakeland PBS News Director, and Matthew Lidke, Bemidji Pioneer Reporter. The rules for tonight's debate are as follows. Each candidate will get three minutes for his opening statement. Our panelists will then ask questions of our candidates. Some of these questions will be of the panelists' own choosing. Others may come from the public. The order of the candidates' responses will be rotated, beginning with opening statements and finishing with their closing comments. Each candidate will have two minutes for each question. Each candidate will also have the chance for a one-minute rebuttal. Tonight, there is also the opportunity for the candidates to deploy one-minute bonus time at some point, either during the initial question or the rebuttal, but it can only be used one time. Questions will continue until we're about 50 minutes into the debate, at which time we'll move on to closing comments. Closing comments are two minutes. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Opening the debate tonight will be Representative John Purcell. John, your opening statement. Oh, good evening. Uh, I'm John Purcell. I'm the current state representative for House District 5A, uh, serving in my fifth term. Um, and I just want to welcome our audience and everybody participating uh, in this debate. And uh, I look forward to questions. I've, I've uh, uh, had the great honor of, of serving House District 5A and uh, that district was uh, 4A previously uh, uh, to the uh, uh, census in 2010, which changed the district a little bit. Um, but uh, largely, largely the same and, and uh, the same basic constituency, I would say. Um, we have significant issues in the district and we've been pursuing this veterans home in Bemidji for um, uh, 12 years now, longer than that probably, but a long time. And uh, there's been progress made and we're now waiting for the federal government to uh, do their part and uh, hopefully we'll be able to break ground and, and uh, get that veteran tone to be a reality. And I, I work a lot with veterans in our uh, area and around the state, as far as that goes, uh, many issues as a disabled Vietnam vet, I uh, uh, get called upon quite a bit uh, for my understanding of the system. And uh, currently working with two uh, veterans who uh, are trying to navigate the VA system. Um, other, uh, issues that we've got going on, uh, ongoing, uh, and some things never go away, it seems, and, and certainly uh, roads and bridges uh, in our area, which are so important for our, our uh, significant tourism uh, economic base here in northern Minnesota, and we need to uh, keep pushing forward to get a bonding bill. We've, it's been a tough, tough road to hole here to get a bonding bill done, and and uh, we need uh, those jobs as well as uh, uh, the work that those jobs produce. So I'm um, looking forward to that. We'll see how we come out of the special session here that uh, uh, my uh, word is that we're probably gonna have another special session in October, perhaps next week. Um, we've done some good work with healthcare and, uh, and prescription drugs in particular insulin. Uh, unfortunately, it took a, a young man dying uh, from not having insulin, uh, that uh, we couldn't, uh, uh, we had to do something. And uh, we did get uh, the insulin bill passed. 
uh, and there's a lot of work yet to be done on health care. So, um, I'm going to readily admit they couldn't see how much time I had left on that, uh, the card that was just shown to me. Uh, but uh, I think I'll just end it there and, and uh, we'll, we'll call it good for an introduction. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, John. Matt, your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, I'm State Representative Candidate Matt Bliss. Uh, I'm a husband to a first grade school teacher, a father to four, grandfather to four wonderful grandchildren, and I have five dogs. Um, I've owned and operated a successful business in the area for 20 years. I've served in the U.S. Navy where I received uh, training in electronics and communications and went on to a 32-year field in the, uh, in the technical industries. Four years ago, I asked you to put your trust in me and elect me as your state representative, and I want to thank you for granting me that privilege. Representing the great people of District 5A in St. Paul is truly an honor. During that time, I strive to be worthy of that honor, and I passed much legislation that not only impacted uh, our area, but the state of Minnesota as well. Unfortunately, two years ago, the election didn't go uh, the way I'd planned, and we lost by a mere 11 votes. That's, if you're doing the math, out of 17,000 votes, that's seven one thousandths of a percentage point. Don't let anybody tell you your vote doesn't count. Um, I want to thank Lakeland Public Television for hosting this debate, and I look forward to a very productive debate. My opponent and I have uh, fundamentally differing views on uh, the role of state government and their limits, and hopefully we can expose and explore those differences, allowing the public to make their own decision uh, when it comes time to mark those ballots. Again, I'm Matt Bliss. I want your vote in November, and I really look forward to this debate. And uh, thank you again for hosting. All right. Thank you, Matt. Just for our candidates' benefit, when you see that cue card, it is 30 seconds. So it gives you a 30 second warning. Thank and you. You are welcome. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> we will move into our first question. Our first question will come from Heidi Holton. Matt, you'll have the chance to answer first. Well, many of the questions we're going to pose to you this evening have to do with living under a pandemic. There's been gridlock at the Minnesota legislature over the executive powers of Governor Walls. Walls is like 49 other governors across the nation, as well as President Trump, who have these executive powers during this pandemic. Um, there's talk of another special session. We heard that from Representative Purcell. Uh, what do you think should happen at the special session? And then what do you think the role of the federal government is in the pandemic? First off, um, the, the pandemic in, in the state, that's uh, we've been fighting it for, I believe, seven months now. Uh, long, actually, that's when uh, the governor put in his 15 days to slow the spread was, was seven months ago. You know, I, I supported that. I, I really did. I didn't, nobody knew what was coming. We needed to step back. We needed to freeze things. And I supported the government in that effort, the governor in that effort. Right now we're on seven months and unfortunately uh, my opponent has not even allowed debate on the floor to remove the government, governor's uh, executive orders uh, or the privilege that he's, he's imposing. And we have 201 legislators and John's one of 134 representatives and uh, I don't know how we can say that, that we're legislators if we're delegating our authority to the governor. Um, I believe the pandemic is real. I believe it's, it's critically important that we address it and make sure we protect our uh, vulnerable citizens. But to allow the governor to continue on with his executive powers and eliminating a complete branch of government, that we have a three level branch of government, the executive, the judicial, and the legislative. And right now we are not even allowing the legislature into the discussions. And I find that, uh, incomprehensible and uh, very, uh, I, I just don't understand how, how we can do this. And John, I, I really respect your service, but you're just, you're acting like an absentee legislator in this pandemic. I please allow the debate, take the vote, stand up for your vote. If you vote to keep the, the powers in place, that's fine, but at least allow the vote to take place. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. John, your answer? Well, this is uh, quite a serious undertaking and uh, I'm pleased that the governor has chosen the path that he has. And as was indicated in the introduction to this question, 
Uh, he's one of 49 governors that, uh, that has emergency powers. I, 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 I really think we have to, to tread carefully here because um, if we, and we, let me back up here. We have had debate. We've had plenty of debate on, uh, and I, I just uh, offer, if you haven't heard the debate on the governor's uh, emergency powers and you aren't listening to uh, the House and the Senate uh, actions, uh, when we've had special session, because there's been plenty of it. I'll spare you how many times, how many people, particularly on the Republican side, have uh, talked about this. And uh, but what I what I really want to <clears throat> want to emphasize is that we've been trying for five, six months longer than that, if you go back to previous sessions, to pass a bonding bill. House and Senate pass a bonding bill. We can't even do that. How could we work in an emergency fashion with the, the divisions the way they are? I don't believe it can work at this current time. There are too many in the Senate and the House that just want to argue. And well, we might not even be able to order PPE, uh, you know, just have face masks. And, the, and who we're trying to protect here is the healthcare workers, the vulnerable, and the elderly. That is what the governor's emergency powers are intended to do: is protect, so that we have healthcare workers to take care of people who get sick. Uh, and if we don't have that, then we're really in a tough spot. So. I, I just would offer that uh, it's tough for us to move ahead. Uh, okay, thank you, John. That's great. Matt, do you have a rule? I sure do. You know, there has been debate. The debate on the floor, and there's a lot of minutia that goes on there, but that you have to suspend the rules to allow the, the legislature to take a vote. John will not even support suspending the rules to allow the legislature to take support. He refuses to do that. It's, it's very irresponsible to, to tell the people that, that um, the, the Republicans are gonna stand on uh, legislation providing PPE to our first responders and healthcare workers. That is patently untrue. The reason we don't have a, uh, thank you. The reason we don't have a bonding bill right now is that was what uh, our leader, Kurt Doubt, decided to stand <clears throat> out on and tell the uh, governor relinquished his powers, we weren't gonna pass a bonding bill. Unfortunately, he hasn't given in on that. Uh, we recognize the need for a bonding bill. I believe there's gonna be something uh, probably coming up in this next session, uh, but to, to insinuate that Republicans would not allow uh, PPE to our first responders is just, it, it's patently untrue. Thank you, Matt. John, a rebuttal? Well, not quite what I said, Matt, but uh, that's the way things get twisted when when uh, the politics get in the middle of it. And it's precisely why we would have a very difficult time uh, passing legislation to do emergency management. That is the purview of the governor. That's why we authorized him to have the powers so that he can move quickly when he needs to. And to have debates about every little thing that we need for emergency powers uh, and emergency actions, it just doesn't seem to fit with me. And I, 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 I want to protect our elders and our healthcare workers. And I think the governor is doing a good job. And that most Minnesotans agree with me, as I recall, 60 some percent agree he's doing a good job. All right. Thank you, John. So we're going to move on to our next question. Our question will come from Dennis Wyman. And John, you'll answer first. The pandemic has had a big, first off, thanks to both of you for being with us again this year, taking part in our debates. Uh, the pandemic has had a big impact on the budget. Earlier this year, we were expecting a $1.5 billion surplus, but now we're projecting a $2.4 billion deficit, and that could even get worse when the next projection comes out, I believe, in November. How would you advocate for dealing with this deficit? And, and please be as specific as you can. All right, John, you're up first. This is indeed uh, an issue and how we 
will deal with this, uh, I'm going to offer is going to, we're going to have to tighten the belt and, and uh, we've already done some of that. Um, and we're going to have to work with the federal government, no two ways about it, to get a uh, additional uh, aid package from the federal government. I know they're working on it. They've been working on it for some time now. Um, but it is absolutely going to take uh, uh, everybody to be involved in a good way um, to try and resolve the issues uh, as we bring our, uh, our businesses back on board, particularly small businesses. And, and I, I uh, ran a small business for almost 30 years for tribal government. And uh, I know what that takes. And uh, it's gonna take a lot of patience and, and some help, some more help from the federal government uh, in order for us to not have to uh, go out uh, to local governments and ask them to cut further than they, than they need to and still be taking care of uh, everybody that needs care in the state. Right now, the demand for uh, for food and shelter in the state of Minnesota is as high as it's ever been. So we definitely have, uh, have our, uh, our work cut out for us. I do think we're going to be able to, uh, to manage, uh, and, and it, but it's going to take a federal state partnership to do it. Okay. I'm done. All right. <laughs> Thanks, John. Matt, your answer. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, Dennis, I don't know where you got the numbers. The number I heard was closer to $5 billion in deficit. Maybe we're, we're talking apples and oranges, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, one of the things back uh, when the pandemic first started and we were aware it was coming, uh, my opponent voted to increase the salary of state employees by 2%. Not saying those people didn't deserve a raise, but if we knew this was coming and we knew we were gonna shut the businesses down and the taxes were gonna drop, we should have held off on that for a, just a little bit, just to make sure that it was going to happen, uh, that we could afford to pay it. Um, Governor Walls should have been cutting his budget uh, by 5%, just again, to, uh, I know the state workers work hard, uh, and, and we need to make sure they're taken care of. But at the same time, small businesses and people that work in these small businesses are really being impacted negatively. And uh, by not taking these uh, steps up front, it's pushing the problem back to next budget cycle. And remember in the state of Minnesota, we have a uh, constitutional amendment that requires us to balance our budget. And we have to, we're coming in this with a $5 billion or $2.4 billion deficit. One of two ways, we're gonna raise the taxes on the individuals and businesses, which in this economy is gonna kill our economy, our small businesses. Uh, John mentioned, you know, we need, we need to give them help. I hope they're still there to get help. There's a lot of businesses that are closing down because we are not allowing them to do their business. Tell me under the government, governor's rules and shutdown orders how I can go buy a pair of shoes at Walmart, but I can't go downtown Bemidji and visit a store like Patterson's Menwear and buy a pair of shoes. We can now, but on the first uh, few months of this uh, shutdown, those rules didn't make any sense. And that's, again, that's why we need that third leg of, of the legislature in there to, to keep uh, public input. We are, or John is, the public's voice down in St. Paul. And by him not allowing us to, to, to vote and have voice on those concerns, it's, it's keeping the people out of there. Uh, as far as going into the future, I know there's a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse down there. Uh, Jim Nobles does a great job pointing it out. And I think <laughs> if we can uh, get him back on the job, we can find ways to cut. Thank you, Matt. John, do you have a rebuttal? Just to say that the governor did take some very early actions and, and his staff took pay cuts, uh, some may recall. And, and so there, there were definitely were efforts uh, to try and stem the tide of what we, what we thought might be coming. Um, remember um, what we were told from the federal government here um, and our, our, the current occupant of the White House uh, this is no big deal, this pandemic. Uh, so that's you know let's let's put let's let's talk about where this stuff came from, uh, and the and the laissez-faire attitude that was brought with this pandemic, and then we realized, oh my, this is a big deal, and so we've been picking up the pieces here in Minnesota and doing a good job. The governor's been doing a good job. We're going to have to tighten our belt. No two ways about it to get the economy back. Okay, Thanks. thank you, John. Matt, your rebuttal? Thank you. Uh, 
John tries to bring in the president to this debate. The president has limited authority as to what he can do under the 10th Amendment. And I, I've heard the Democrat talking points lately that this is the Trump economy. This is the Trump economy. It was a Democrat governor that shut our, our economy down. And again, by, by keeping these small businesses closed and allowing these large corporations to run, that double and triple impacted our economy. Not only does it uh, keep the, the profits, it doesn't keep them local. The, the people that work for these small businesses are out of work and they're laid off. And we need to get those people back to work. We need to do it now safely. We need to, to work with the governor's uh, health department and the, and the national health uh, directives to, to make sure that we open safely, that we definitely need to reopen and, and do it safely and do it now. All right, thank you, Matt. We're going to move to the next question. So Matthew's question, Matt's first response. Hi, Matt. I wanted to talk about water infrastructure in this question. Uh, as you both know, water infrastructure has been a heavy topic lately for Bemidji. Um, the city is looking at um, two projects and one has already started uh, to treat water. Um, and these projects are based on policy standards set by state agencies like the MPCA and such. My question is, does the legislature have to con uh, consider any legislation or um, any sort of um, review of the water across Minnesota? Because it seems like based on MPCA standards, um, more cities could be facing projects like this. And in doing so, they'll need state support. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, the water problem in Bemidji, um, uh, we, I believe they first found it when I was in office. Um, the MPCA, under abundance of caution, lowered the standards more than, than even the federal guidelines by quite a bit, and that uh, caught a few cities uh, under that, that umbrella. Um, I do believe that the state needs to help uh, the city of Bemidji and other places where we find uh, the issues of water infrastructure. Um, we, we need to step up and we need to help them out uh, as much as we can. And uh, I believe the MPCA does a, does a fine job on monitoring these standards. And I would, uh, I would support them in the Bemidji uh, area, at least on the infrastructure rebuild for Bemidji. All right, thank you, Matt. John, your answer? Uh, very similar. Uh, and I've, I've got the bill uh, that 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 is included in the in the current bonding bill proposal, the house bonding proposal uh, for assistance to uh, um, the city of Bemidji uh, as they uh, strive to um, and and are required to. I believe Matt referred to this uh, required to by the Department of Health uh, to treat that water. Uh, they don't have a choice. And uh, the, uh, I, but I've got a bill that's part of the bonding bill to assist the city in doing that. And, and uh, talking about water infrastructure, uh, the city of Deer River is also in the bonding bill that we're endeavoring to pass uh, for a new sewage treatment plant that will significantly upgrade their capability for economic development around Deer River. And uh, so those are two really big, uh, water infrastructure uh, projects uh, in District 5A. And um, I alluded to the bonding bill early on, and I'm probably gonna say it a couple more times. It's very important uh, for District 5A, for all of Minnesota, uh, for jobs, uh, as well as uh, the health and well-being of, of the citizens of Minnesota and in our district. All right, Thanks. thank you, John. Matt, do you have a rebuttal? Only to say that uh, I do support these projects. Uh, I believe the Deer River project has been in there for a few years now, and I believe I was one of the co-sponsors of that one initially in 17 or 18. Uh, and I know I met with the city leaders in Bemidji once the project or once the water quality uh, issues were identified and told them that I would be happy to work with them at the state <clears throat> level in any way I could to address the issue. Okay, thank you, Matt. John, a rebuttal? No, not at this time, thank you. All right, thank you. We will move on to Heidi's question with John that you'll answer first. 
During the current pandemic, Minnesota teachers and paraprofessionals and staff have had to be flexible and they've worked harder than ever before. There's been an uptick in COVID numbers and changes and decisions are being made in Northern Minnesota. Some families have had some success with this distance learning and hybrid learning, but for many, there are great disparities that are coming forward and it's affected every aspect of families' lives. What can you do as a legislator for the people of your district when it comes to education? Thank you. That's a significant um, question for sure. And, and you raised a couple of things. And, and uh, I'll just tell you that I hear about this firsthand. Uh, my oldest daughter, my oldest child uh, has an uh, early childhood education uh, facility in Bemidji and uh, the the processes and procedures that they're having to go through um, to ensure that they are not exposed, the teachers and the kids are not exposed and bringing the virus to, to school. They are doing uh, school. They're doing it in, in ways that uh, keep children, you know, distance and, and the mask wearing. Um, but it is a big challenge, no two ways about it. And, and, and to add to that, as I think you, you, you implied, uh, the, the internet challenges that we have, the, having internet access throughout particularly rural Minnesota. And you know, we've, we've put, we the legislature, uh, we the state of Minnesota have put uh, significant funding into uh, expanding internet access. Uh, in rural Minnesota, and we're going to have to put more funding into it. It's just, it's, it's really tough when you get out into the woods uh, for uh, um, children, for anybody to have uh, good access that they can depend on uh, for school, et cetera. So um, we, we're challenged, we're challenged in, in the, from early childhood education all the way through uh, um, technical school and technical college and, and university education, all the way up. Uh, we've got our challenges and this, as you indicated, this uh, coronavirus has made that all the more difficult. I do believe that we're, we're getting things figured out. Uh, we have to err on the side of caution uh, and be protective of, of our neighbors, of our okay. elders. Uh, the healthcare workers. Okay. Uh, John, that, that's good. Safe. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, go ahead. Your response, your answer, I should say. Yeah, thank you. Um, as, as I mentioned in my opening statement, my wife is a first grade public school teacher. Uh, and my daughter actually is a sixth grade public school teacher. So I, this is real, real important to me. Um, you know, I think we can address it in multiple levels. Uh, you know, the high school kids and the middle school kids they can handle distance learning a little bit better uh, than, than what my wife affectionately refers to as the littles, you know, the first, second, and third graders that try to keep their attention on something uh, inside the home uh, for more than 15 to 20 seconds is, is a hurdle that, that most people can't deal. I've watched my wife uh, line up 20 kids between the ages of three and eight, and they all sat and lap, uh, in, in rapt attention to listen to her speak. That is a special talent. Uh, that, that only a few people can can muster. Uh, myself, I'd be a puddle of mud in a corner in 30 seconds if I tried it. That aside, um, I think that John mentioned broadband. Absolutely, we need to invest in broadband. I sit here in my house uh, using this Zoom and I technically don't have broadband here. I, my neighbors have zero. I was able to, through my technical uh, expertise, build a, a backbone network into my place so I have internet service. Not everybody can do that. Um, the, we need to invest in uh, more innovative uh, distance learning techniques, which may be, by the way, the wave of the future. Uh, what this pandemic is showing us is that, you know, maybe there, there's certain options that we can explore. Um, and uh, I think we need to, to fully support our teachers, give them the tools they need. Uh, my nephew is in the field of developing distance learning software. Who knew that uh, he was going to be so busy this year? Um, but, uh, you know, Maybe we can invest in that. Again, the broadband is definitely something. John, I agree with you on that. Uh, I like the smaller incremental approaches to broadband, maybe 20 to $40 million a year versus 
throwing it all at one time. You get some uh, projects that doing it that way that just aren't worth it. Uh, the smaller ones and their competitive projects make it much more uh, viable. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. John, a rebuttal? No, thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to the next question. Our next question will come from Dennis Wyman. Matt, you'll answer first. Big issue or big topic in your district is obviously line three. It'd be a huge economic impact on the district. The Minnesota Public Utilities Commission has approved the project. Uh, saying the new pipeline would be safer and pose less risk to the environment than the current pipeline. But the Minnesota Department of Commerce has appealed once again, so it's hung up in appeals processes. Do you support the project moving forward or do you feel the delays are warranted? This is probably one of the most uh, studied and, uh, and, and fought over projects in Minnesota history. I think this project has, has well earned the ability to go forward. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's incredible that the governor during his campaign when he's trying to be elected uh, by the one Minnesota that he calls it, uh, guaranteed us he wouldn't step on a hose if his PUC commission approved it. Uh, well, they did, five to zero uh, unanimously. And then miraculously, he's going to sue himself. Uh, the Commerce Commissioner is going to sue the PUC or whatever. Both his uh, employees are suing each other uh, over this project. We can't afford to have these delays anymore. Line three has been studied and modified and studied and modified for years and years and years. And we need to move forward with it. The line that is in the ground right now is failing. Uh, President Obama was the one that said this line needs to be replaced. We need to shut it down, clean it out and replace it. Uh, and, and, and that's a $2.6 billion in private investment. My opponent mentioned a, a bonding bill of jobs that need to be created. Yes, those jobs are gonna be good, but this is private money that's gonna go in, $2.6 billion of private money in our state. And that, that's not just for the welders, it's not just for the, the linesmen, it's gonna go out uh, through uh, people spending their paychecks to the local gas stations, the local, gro local grocery stores, hotels. Um, all these people are gonna benefit, not to mention uh, the property tax income on the, the, on the new route that increase for those counties is going to be massive. And that's what we pay for our local projects at schools. Uh, the, the county tax, uh, property tax is what funds all of our local projects here in the counties and, and funds our sheriff's departments, our schools, our, our road and infrastructure at the county level. So yeah, we need to move forward with this right now. And the governor needs to stop impeding the progress. All right. Thank you, Matt. John, your answer. Well, I, I uh, support the line three for a lot of the reasons that have been cited. Uh, certainly there are jobs that uh, um, a few will be long lasting and, and, and most of them will be for several years. But the, the overall rationale for supporting line three is that it the current line is in ill repair and the current line goes underneath water bodies such as Cass Lake right in the heart of the district and the, at, the, at the heart, if you will, of, uh, of the upper Mississippi watershed. Uh, so the safety issues are paramount and, and having uh, moving uh, this oil uh, in a safe way, if, if we don't have the, the, the pipeline, it's gonna be moved through trains, light, largely through trains. So, so this is more efficient uh, and uh, we are, to be sure, I know there are those who you know, talk about petroleum and, and uh, its contribution to climate change. And there are those who don't believe that climate change is real also, but um, I do. I mean, climate change is a real deal. It, 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 science supports that by far, but, but we need to start weaning off of petroleum products. And at the same time, petroleum products are very essential for our national security. So for all of those reasons, uh, the, on the, the side of, of line three, I support it. Um, I believe that what the governor is, is going through right now is largely uh, endeavoring to, uh, and I, I don't know this for sure. This is my, my, uh, um, my well, from where I sit, what I think about it, largely trying to prevent further litigation, which may happen anyway. Um, but there's been a lot of litigation on this, and and uh, that's that's 
going to happen uh, in the future too likely. And so I'll leave it there. Thank you, John. Matt, a rebuttal? Yes. Uh, I, I find it interesting that, that my opponent says he supports line three, but then attends a fundraiser uh, community rally hosted by Minnesota 350. And as you know, that is one of the most uh, uh, environment, uh, most radical environmental groups in the country. And for him to say that he supports it, but then attends that rally, that just shows you, you know, the John John's wears the mask of a moderate uh, when he's in the district. When he goes to St. Paul, he's held hostage by the metro uh, environmental liberals down in St. Paul. And and also, you know, the governor by suing himself, think of the tax dollars. It's going to be millions and millions of tax dollars spent defending this and suing this. He's suing himself, remember, uh, on a project that just <clears throat> needs to move forward. So that, that's my response. Okay, thank you, Matt. John, a rebuttal? Well, uh, you just made some news. There's a lot of folks that are gonna, gonna be surprised I'm held hostage by Twin Cities, I think. Uh, I, I know that's, that's pretty outrageous, ludicrous stuff, Matt. Uh, um, no, I've done environmental quality work for 40 plus years in Northern Minnesota, written standards to protect environmental quality. Uh, so this is, you know, come on. Um, what we need is to move that crude in a safe way. And I support that. It's a national defense issue among other things. And I sit here 50 yards or less from a wind turbine that's been producing energy for more than 15 years in my backyard. We have to have all of the above if we're gonna move ahead as a state and a country for energy in our state. Okay, thank you, John. Our next question will come from Matthew and John will be the first responder. Uh, this is a district that covers ground in uh, Native American reservations, and I wanted to ask um, how you as a representative will continue working with the uh, Native American issues on the reservations, especially Red Lake and uh, Leech Lake, and um, what improvements do you feel should be made um, in partnering with the reservations as we head into the 2020s? Well, thank you for that question. I'm going to get real close here. You can see this pin on my lapel. That's that's the uh, emblem of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Um, I'm married to a Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe woman. Family, grandkids, Leech Lake Band members. And uh, I worked on Leech Lake Reservation. I indicated earlier, 40 years, uh, 40 plus years. So I understand uh, the issues that you're talking about and uh, it, it's basically communication and being open to everybody's ideas. Um, we just talked about environmental quality, uh, a huge issue for tribes trying to protect their treaty rights, hunting and fishing. And, and it is a significant issue when we have coal burning power plants on either side of Leech Lake Reservation from North Dakota and over in Cohasset that emit mercury and that gets into our walleye. And you know, as I'm sure you all know, right now, a woman of childbearing age cannot eat walleye over two pounds in Minnesota. That's a disgrace. That is an absolute disgrace that we've gotten to that point, but that's where we are. So we need to continue to work on all of these issues. There's a lot of, of, uh, of uh, tax issues uh, with the counties that, uh, that that share uh, area with uh, tribal governments. And by and large, I, I would offer to you, we should follow the Cass, lay, the Cass County example. They've done a wonderful job in working with the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe and that needs to be taken to across the state to our work with our state work with, with other tribal governments. So that's, uh, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, John. Matt, your answer. Well, you know, I I was an employee at the at the Red Lake Band uh, for a little over ten years. Uh, I I enjoyed that time. I made a lot of good contacts up there. I think the communication link between uh, the Red Lake Band and myself, I think, is pretty good. Um, the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. I live within the boundaries of the reservation, and uh, I have met with uh, the chairman several times. I think we have a good relationship. Uh, again, and my uh, the local district rep. Uh, uh, for the district that I 
reside in. I've met with him several times. And I think uh, as long as we keep those communications lines open, um, I would like to see a regular meeting um, set up in advance uh, with myself and the tribal leaders uh, to discuss their options. And last, last uh, time when I was in the office, it was the scheduling uh, just didn't work out for the, the chairman to meet with me uh, from the Red Lake Band. And I'd like to work on that a little bit more this time around, uh, make sure that we have a standing meeting, uh, whether it be once a month, once a week, uh, when I'm back in town, doesn't matter. I just want to make sure that those those lines of communications are open. Okay. Thank you, Matt. John, a rebuttal? Well, I, I just think it's important to understand how how the government to government relations work with between the state and the tribe. And ordinarily, tribal chairs meet with the governor. Um, and now certainly uh, as a state representative, I've been invited uh, to all of the uh, area the Leech Lake, Red Lake, White Earth, all of our areas, uh, 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 tribal government offices and met with the, with the tribal councils, including the chairs. But it's, it, that's part of the important understanding is that uh, they are nations and the tribal chair is, is at that status with the governor or arguably uh, with the president of the United States. Um, so it's, it's important to understand that and as as I continue to work in Indian country um, I bring that knowledge to the table and will continue to do so okay Matt a rebuttal just a little one yeah of course I understand that John uh, I was a, an employee at the Red Lake Tribal Council worked directly with the chairman uh, for 10 years I was also an employee at the uh, Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe for eight years I'm very familiar with how uh, tribal tribal or tribal to government relations work tribal government to state government relations were very familiar with that. What I am saying though, is there are priorities that, that uh, we represent down there and initiatives that the tribe supports that we need to make sure that we're on top of and we're pushing through and looking out for the agenda items uh, that the governments of the tribal governments want uh, advanced in St. Paul. Yes, he is at par with the, with the governor or the president, uh, but there are initiatives at the state representative level that need to be pushed. And that's what I was addressing. Okay, thank you. Our next question will come from Heidi and Matt, you'll answer first. Do you have confidence in our election system in Minnesota mm -hmm. and in the country, you personally, but what are you also hearing from voters in your district? Well, that's a timely question, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I, I hear from the DFL, the, this whole election cycle, even before uh, the primaries, that they wanted to push, 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 push mail-in balloting. Um, why? Uh, universal mail-in balloting is, is, is open for, for uh, wide corruption. Look what's happening down in Minneapolis right now with, uh, with, with the Project Veritas. I know you're going to say they're a right-wing uh, conspiracy group, but, but disprove what they're saying. And it, it's, it's, it's scary. We've had, we have absentee balloting in Minnesota, which is different than universal mail-in balloting, much different. In absentee balloting, you request the ballot. You actually put in a request to your county to get a mail-in ballot sent to you. We have been doing that for a long time. It works well. Universal mail-in balloting is much, much different. It's, it's taking the voter rolls and mailing ballots just blindly out to your district. Our voter rolls in Minnesota are not very well maintained. Uh, we need to, to I, I do not like the mail-in system. Um, I think that the way we have worked on it in the past with the absentee balloting, the early voting is great. I think it is. And here in Beltrami County, um, during our, our uh, recount for the last election, um, mm -hmm. our county auditor was given very, very high grades uh, by the people who've done this many times in the past. So I have complete confidence in our county auditor and the way she handles her, her elections. Same goes for Cass and task and Hubbard counties as well. But to, to put the universal mail and push the universal mail-in ballot, I think is a bad idea. Uh, it's especially in a, an election like this where uh, the, the outcome is gonna be close and there's gonna be uh, problems, whether it be intentional problems by intentional uh, fraud or just problems that, that arise because of the, the new system that we're trying to push into place. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a fiasco if, if, if we allow that to happen. Okay. Thank you, Matt. John. 
I have uh, the utmost confidence in our election system and the integrity there too. And I'm really happy we have paper ballots in Minnesota. And uh, that only adds to um, the source of my confidence. I, I Just to address what was brought up and I, I heard mention there about uh, some something sounded kind of political about mail-in ballots, et cetera. The big push, as I understand it, for um, uh, mail-in uh, voting, uh, remote voting, is due to the coronavirus and people who uh, don't care to go out um, and and expose, be exposed, and uh, and that's that's fine. I think that that's makes sense, especially for elders uh to uh vote remotely if they can and uh so I, I, that's that's where the push is coming from as as i understand it and uh and i don't know i i i, I don't want to invoke uh, the current occupant of the white house too many more times but doesn't he vote by mail he had done that for many years president trump and uh, now all of a sudden it's a bad thing so i don't know if it's a bad thing it's a bad thing for him too then but uh that's that just doesn't doesn't make sense. But then there's a lot of things going on out in the White House right now that don't make sense too. So I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you, John. Matt, we'll move to your rebuttal, but just as a heads up, this will be our last question. So after these rebuttals, we'll move on to closing comments. So go Thank ahead you. and take it away. Yeah, John, there's a huge difference between absentee balloting and mail in and universal mail in balloting. And you know that. We've done absentee balloting for a long time. That works. Uh, a couple of years ago, we passed the no excuse absentee balloting where you don't have to say you're out of town. You can just say, hey, I don't want to go to the polls for whatever reason. You're laid up. Your car is broke down. You're afraid of getting sick. Those are all valid reasons to request a mail-in ballot. That is far, far different than universal mail-in balloting, and you know that. Okay. Thanks, Matt. John, your rebuttal? Uh, just to clarify, I tried to say that... Uh, the remote balloting is in large part due to the, 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 the push for remote balloting or the, the idea for remote balloting is large part due to the coronavirus and people not going to the polling place, feeling uncomfortable going to the polling place, but still wanting to vote. It's that simple. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move into closing comments. Our first closing comments will come from John. And again, these are two minutes. I want to thank Lakeland Public TV for this opportunity. Um, Y'all are doing a good job on a uh, and, and, and tough duty here, and and uh, I uh, absolutely uh, I I didn't know how, what I was going to think about this floor bat, mind you, um, but this, you've made it nice, you've made it easy. Thank you, and uh, thanks to all the viewers out there, um, and uh, thank you, Matt Bliss, for participating and to our Questioners, uh, I, I just would say, you know, this this election cycle is nothing like I've ever experienced. And I've told more than a couple of people that I've had fewer questions about my race and my opponent than I've had about the national race, presidential race, et cetera. It's just, that's just the way it's been. And, and uh, of course, I, I'm not doing a lot of door knocking. I just think that that's uh, not the thing to do here. And in this coronavirus epidemic time. Uh, but uh, it, I get a lot of questions uh, when I'm on the phones uh, about uh, other issues. And uh, I do get asked a, a couple of times, more than a couple of times, uh, when are we gonna get that bonding bill? That is one of the biggest issues that I hear about right now. Another one is healthcare. Are we gonna be able to protect healthcare for all Minnesotans? and to be affordable. And uh, my answer is I'm gonna do my best to protect healthcare for all Minnesotans. I'm gonna do my best to get a bonding bill passed so that we can uh, keep the roads and bridges in our area uh, in good shape and invite those tourists up that, that go to my opponent's resort for crying out loud. This is, this is what we need to do for Minnesota and it's good jobs too. So 
Um, thank you for the opportunity and uh, look forward to uh, uh, watching this event. Thank you. Thanks, John. Matt, your closing comments? I want, I want to thank Lakeland for putting this on. Uh, like John said, uh, the format is nice. Uh, I, I still think the, the person to person uh, is, is good. Uh, maybe we're going to have to hold off another couple of years for that to, that to happen again. Uh, but this is this is good this time. Uh, you get to see my lovely uh, lodge here uh, and where I get to live most of my time. Uh, and uh, over the past hour, you've heard two different visions for our area. And I, I think that I've demonstrated uh, my, my visions and I know uh, my opponents demonstrated his, you know, that it's time for the people to step up to make their decision. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, when I was in St. Paul, I was able to provide the, the, finally provide the funding for the Bemidji Veterans Home, uh, the state funding. And as John said, we're still waiting on that federal funding. Uh, I've been working with uh, our Congressman Pete Stauber and uh, Colin Peterson to, to try to you push the federal level on that. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still seeing, we're still going to see the problems that we saw before the pandemic, uh, in addition to the pandemic and the budget shortfalls that we're going to see because of that shutdown. Uh, I want to be able to make sure that we address those when I get down in St. Paul. And uh, finally, I uh, just want to, I'm a Christian, a husband, a father, a grandfather, veteran, small business owner, hunter, fisherman, and conservationist. And I want to make sure that when I get down to St. Paul, that I represent our northern northern Minnesota values uh, down there. And uh, I just asked for your vote on November 3rd. That's Matt Bliss. And uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. I especially want to thank our candidates, Representative John Purcell and Matt Bliss, for joining us and participating in Debate Night 2020. This concludes our second night of state legislative debates. Stay tuned later this week as Lakeland PBS will continue featuring nine state legislative debates over four nights of television. If you missed a portion of any of tonight's debates or if you would like to watch it again, they will be available on the Lakeland PBS website within 24 hours. That website is lptv.org. Also, be sure to read a recap of this debate in Saturday's Bemidji Pioneer newspaper or online at BemidjiPioneer.com. Debate Night 2020 will return on Thursday as Lakeland PBS will feature debates for two more state races. First up at 8 p.m. will be the candidate seeking to represent State Senate District 9, Republican Senator Paul Gazelka and DFL candidate John Peters. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Have a great night and we'll see you later this week.